life is full of happiness, of joy. All of us experience this. But what happens when it all fades away? What happens when joy is replaced by trials, tribulations, and storms? How do we find our way back? How to be happy in an unhappy world. And uh, the title of the message today is that peace breeds happiness. Peace breeds happiness. Now, we discovered last week, if you weren't here, or just to refresh you, that true lasting happiness is always tied more to a Thank you. Five of you were awake last week. Happiness, true lasting happiness, is always tied more to a who than a what. A who or a group of who's than a what. When what you have or what you want or what you get, when that's the source of your happiness, it always leads to what's next, what's to come what I want, what else, what's new. But real happiness, real joy, real contentment is always tied to a who or a group of who's, even if that who is you, rather than a what. So today we're going to sort of try to unpack that a little bit and see what that means to us, how that plays out in our everyday lives. For the rest of this series... Whenever I ask you the question, what can bring you true lasting happiness, your reply should be nothing. Nothing. No thing. No thing can bring you true lasting happiness. Only a who or a group of who's. Nothing, no thing. I told you about, some of you have heard, if you listen to country music, especially the song that's out now, money can't buy me happiness, but it can buy me a boat. And that's about the way it is. That's, that's about the truth. If you have lots of money, you can buy lots of boats. But what you can't buy is true, lasting happiness. But I want to look at a few attributes or characteristics that you're going to find in in most, if not all, happy people. A few characteristics that happy people share. I want to I want to talk about uh, three specific things today. Three things that you're going to notice about all happy people. I want you to think about someone you know who appears to be genuinely happy and content. We may not be one of those people, but most of us know one of those people who it seems like no matter what happens in their life, they encounter problems just like the rest of us. They have bad days, but in spite of it, they still just have this unmistakable happiness about them. There was a guy, him and his wife used to attend church here, and and uh, I'm terrible with names. I shouldn't be, but I am, and and uh, But there was something about him, and occasionally he and his wife would come up in a conversation, uh, Missy and I would be at home, and so we would say, you know, Smiley and his wife. I mean, that wasn't his name. Nobody else called him that, but that's how we knew, and we knew exactly who, who we were talking about because this guy had a smile all the time. And he had, he had been through some stuff. I mean, but, but he had had challenges in his life, but he always just had this, this something about him, something, this, this joy, this happiness. Um, now, the Apostle Paul said one time, talking about this happiness, this joy, this contentment, this peace, 
He said, I've learned this. It wasn't a gift given to me. It wasn't something I just something that was bestowed upon me. He said, I've learned that in whatever state I'm in, therewith to be at content or to be at peace. I've learned how to do that. And hopefully through this series, we're going to learn that too. That's the whole purpose of this four-part series is to teach us what Paul learned. That in whatever circumstances, whether good, whether bad, whatever we're going through, to learn how to be at peace, to be happy. So the one attribute that, that people seem to have is they all seem to have a peace. Happy people have a peace, or you might say they're at peace. And number one, here's the three things I want to talk about. Number one, they're at peace with themselves. Regardless of what their circumstances are, regardless of what comes their way, regardless of what others are saying about them or accusing them of or whatever, they just have this peace about them. And in fact, sometimes we look at their circumstances and, and, and we say, we say, you know, they're just in denial. I mean, you know, they're just, they're just not, nobody can be that happy. I mean, we seem like we're more worried about their circumstances than they are. Yeah, you ever had somebody like that? It's like, wake up, man. You're broke and don't have a job. Worry. Don't you have any sense? Worry. You should be worried. You, you, you know, you've lost your child. Worry. You've lost your, your spouse. Worry. You know, the, the doctor says it's stage four cancer, man. Worry. You've got to say, you know, what are you doing smiling? What are you doing happy? What's wrong with you? But Pastor John taught us Wednesday night that when Jesus and his disciples were going through a storm, and, and, and it was a bad storm, that the disciples were worrying and Jesus, it said, took a seat cushion, made himself a pillow, and took a nap in the back of the boat. He was at this great peace. That doesn't even make sense. And, and let, let me just chase a little rabbit real quick with that. But, but have you ever thought about why? Why? I mean, the panic, their worry, this was a big storm. Big storm. And... and if Jesus had been on the shore saying, guys, why are you worrying? Because that's what he did when they woke him up and said, don't you care that we perish? He says, why are you worrying? What are you worried about? Now, if he had been on the shore saying, guys, what are you worrying about? I'm sorry. No disrespect. I would have said, Jesus, I love you, but that is a dumb question. Look at us. We're, by, you know, we're bouncing around and seas, but we're about to drown. What do you mean? But the fact that Jesus was in the boat with them gave him the, 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 the reason to say, why are you worried? I'm right here, and guess what? God doesn't drown. You can't drown God. So as long as God's in the boat, you're going to be okay. What are you worried about? I'm God and God doesn't drown. So that, that gives the question legitimacy. So Jesus has this incredible peace about him, and he's trying to get them to have a peace, not because of their circumstances or surrounding, but because God is right here with us. Right here with us. So... Uh, as a result of this peace, they seem to find happiness, these people, even in unhappy circumstances. So number one, happy people are at peace with themselves. They're not trying to impress anybody. They're not trying to be something they're not. They're just at peace with themselves. Number two is happy people are at peace with others. When you see someone who's genuinely just got a smile on their face and they're genuinely, they have this lasting peace, they are gen, uh, generally at peace with others. Even if they've been mistreated, 
Even if they've been abused, even if even they're just, they seem like they're not angry. They're not bitter. You, you hear their story and you think, you can't let them get away with that. Man, you got to get even. You can't be a doormat for them to walk all over you. You got to get revenge. You got to get some justice here. You got to do, and they're like, no, uh, I'm just going to choose to have peace. I'm not going to drink of the poison of bitterness and expect them to die. I don't have time to get bitter. I don't have time to get angry. I don't have time to get even. I'm just going to get peace. As we said, tomorrow we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Day. So many, so many people, both black and white, often would get so angry with, with Dr. King because even in the face of seeing his race so horribly mistreated and misjudged and abused, he chose to walk in peace rather than hate. He, he became known for his strength and his courage and his dream through peace. He never condemned the white generation or any generation. He only said, I have a dream. I have a dream that one day little black children and little white children can sit down across the table from each other and be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's my dream. Only that, that they be judged by their character and not by the color. And so he led protests, he, but, he, he did, but he always insisted there'd be peaceful protests. He lived, and I believe he died, at peace with himself and at peace with others. I want to read you a scripture out of Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to this. Verse 14. It says, work at live it, work, work at it. This takes work. Work at living in peace with everyone. That takes work. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Wow. Look after each other so none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Watch out that no root, poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. If you're going to be a happy person, if you're going to find happiness in an unhappy world, you're going to have to learn to live at peace with other people. You can't walk around, you know, with revenge and with bitterness and with anger and with unforgiveness and all of these things. It just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And number three, most of the time when you find truly happy people, not always, but most of the time, they're not only at peace with themselves, they're not only at peace with others, but they're at peace with God. Even if their view of God may be slightly different than your view of God, even if they have different convictions than you have, even if what God looks like may be different than what you think God looks like, but ultimately, you usually find happy people at peace with their God. Listen, listen to this right here. Whatever you allow to rob you, to rob you of your peace will ultimately rob you of your happiness. We're talking about how can I be happy in an unhappy world. If you let something rob you of your peace, ultimately it's going to rob you of your happiness. You remember that verse in Isaiah 26, 3? Because now we get to it. Okay, I get that. So how do I get peace? If peace is the pathway to happiness, that's fine. But how do I get peace? The prophet Isaiah told us in, in 26, 3, speaking on behalf of the Lord, he says, I will keep them in perfect peace 
whose minds are stayed on me. I'll keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on me. Let your mind get start, start wondering to your enemy. Let your mind start wondering to what somebody's done to you, what somebody said to you. Let your mind start wondering and giving in to fear and worry and stress and all this. We get out of peace. We lose our happiness. He says, keep your mind on me and I'll keep you in peace. When I keep you in peace, you'll be happy. That will lead you to happiness. It is the pathway that God's chosen for happiness. Most of the time, think about it, when we make a bad decision, a decision that challenges our, our morals and our convictions, in other words, it's wrong, and it's not wrong because somebody else says it's wrong, it's wrong because we believe it's wrong. So whatever your convictions are, you, you choose to go ahead and do it anyway, it ultimately, without fail, ends in regret and a loss of peace. And the loss of peace inevitably results in a loss of happiness and joy. Think about it. The whole New Testament basically revolves around three things. Number one, having peace with yourselves. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled. All of these things. Things about being at peace with yourself. It's, it's salt and pepper all through the New Testament. All of these things. Be at peace with yourself. Be at peace with yourself. Number two, having peace with others. We find things like forgive one another as I have forgiven you. Love one another as I have loved you. Care for one another as I have cared for you. It's all through the New Testament. And number three then is love God. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. Have peace with God. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. My burden's light. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. His mercies are new every morning. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's all through the New Testament. You got be at peace with yourself. Be at peace with with others and be at peace with God. That's what the New Testament is built on. The lawyers asked Jesus one time, trying to trap him, they said, what is the greatest law? And, and, and they certainly expected to hear a thou shalt not do something. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Give us, they demanded, the greatest law or the most important law. And Jesus gave that awesome response that's become the cornerstone of our faith and our belief in our lives. He said, the first and greatest commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. But he said, wait, wait, I can't give you the first without giving you the second. The second is that you love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two commandments, you can hang all the law. What an incredible answer. Later, just before he left us and, and to, to ascend back to heaven, he says, he sits with his disciples and he says, okay, guys, listen, a new commandment I'm giving you. I want you to love one another the way I've loved you. Can you imagine their mind starts reeling about how he has loved them, how he's seen them love the world ever since they knew him. And he says, that's the way I want you to love one another. So the greatest commandment, not suggestion, not good idea, not I'll try this and see, the greatest commandment we have today, Jesus says, we're to love. Be at peace with ourselves, with others, and with God. Just love. See, we don't usually think of a command or the law as being the path to happiness. In fact, we, we, we usually see the law as a hindrance to our happiness, right? 
I can't do this, I can't do that, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. You can't drink, smoke, chew, or run with those that do. You can't go to the movies, you can't go here, you can't go there. I've got the laws, and it's like everything that makes me happy, I can't do. And Jesus said, listen, I got a new commandment for you. Love one another. Love one another the way I've loved you. And on these two commandments to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. See, if I love God with all my heart and I love you like I love myself, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to be committing adultery with your wife. I'm not going to be, you know, all of these laws. He said, on these two laws, you can hang all the commandments. Just get these two right. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the bottom line is God says the greatest key to happiness is love. How, how awesome is that? The greatest key to happiness is love. You want to be happy? All right. Love God, love others, and love yourself. And remember that love's not just some ooey-gooey feeling. Love is an action. Love's not a noun. Love is a verb. It's an action word. Don't just tell me you love me. If you love me, love me. Do something. So find a creative way to show your love. The last thought for today is, is and then we're going to close and get ready for next week. But I can't really close this message without injecting one word into this. And, and that word, it's, it's an ugly word to us, but, it, but it's, it's sin. Because as, as we said, Jesus said the greatest commandment, not suggestion, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So when we refuse to do that, We sin. Put any kind of label you want on it. Say, that's the way I was raised. I just don't like this. I just don't like that. I don't like black people. I'm sorry. I don't like white people. I just can't have it. That's just because they do this and they do that. And, they, and it's always they. It's always they. It's not a person. You've heard me say, we don't know what we like. We just like what we know. Right? You got, you got a lot of black people say, I don't like white people. I say, you don't know me. You know me, you like me. I like you. It's not about the color of our skin. It's about the conduct of our character. This is a commandment. This is not a commandment. This is the commandment. If you miss this one, you miss everything. We have got to get this one right. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and let that love flow through you and love others like you love yourself. He said this is a new commandment. You love others like I've loved you. When we refuse to love someone because of their skin color, because of their sexual preference, because of their ethnicity, because of their, their social standing, we sin and we become guilty of breaking not a commandment, but the commandment. And listen, sin always separates. It separates you from peace with God. It separates you from peace with others, and it separates you even from peace with yourself. Once you're separated from peace, you ultimately become separated from happiness. That's why you find prejudiced people, you find proud people, you find intolerant people. That's why you always find them standing on picket lines and protest lines, petitioning against anything they can get their names on, and they're marching against this and marching against that, and, and with a snarl on their face and gravel in their voice, they're crying, sinner! And they walk out in front of the abortion clinics or this place or that place, and they're, they're, they're crying, sinner! And they're so angry. Is that happiness? There's no joy 
There's no happiness. There, there's, there's something kind of rage that's in them. There's something that, all, all of the things that God says, I hate that stuff. I hate that stuff. Why do you seek to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a log in your own eye? You're walking around looking at sins, plural, and I'm telling you, you're hitting the big sin. The big one. Love God with all your heart. Love others. Even if you totally disagree with them, love them anyway. Even if you hate what they're doing, love them anyway. Even if you disagree with him, love them anyway. Can I let you in on something? Jesus probably disagrees with some things I know or do or whatever, and he loves me anyway. He disagrees with some things you know or believe or live or doing, and he loves you anyway. That doesn't stop him from loving us. Why should it stop us from loving somebody else? Love them anyway. Learn how to be at peace with who you are. You're not a duplication or an imitation. You're a one-of-a-kind creation. Act like it and you'll attain one of the keys to finding true, lasting happiness. Think about, I, I saw a, a quote this week, and it was talking about pride, but as I read through it, I thought, you know, you could easily exchange the word pride for happiness. Now, I can't read it to you, because my phone was on like 2% battery this morning. So I was going to, but, but here's, here's the essence of what it says is that we think pride is about having stuff, looking good, having money, all of the things that we think sort of make us proud or make us happy. And this writer said, that's not what makes a person proud or happy. What makes a person proud or happy is having more money than others, better looking than others, more stuff than others. You can have the same amount, you know, as you've got now, and as long as it's more than others, we're proud and we're happy. But don't change ours, just bring everybody else up to our level. We're not happy anymore. Because now we're not up here. And that's what brings pride when we think we're up here. Get everybody else up here and it takes away our pride and it takes away our happiness. That's why Jesus said, he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he who exalts himself, I will humble. Happiness is not in stuff. Happiness is not in money. Happiness is not in achievements. In fact, happiness, what brings happiness? Thank you. Give a prize to that man back there. No thing. Nothing. No matter how much nothing you get, how many things you acquire, no thing or no amount of things can bring you true, lasting happiness. Three people hit the Powerball this week. They're happy. Make no mistake about it, they're happy. Make no mistake about this. What happened this week will not bring them everlasting, continual happiness. In fact, if they stay true to statistics and most people, they'll be unhappy within five years and broke. It's just the way it is. No thing brings true happiness. Happiness is always tied to a who, not a what. Even if that who is you. Amen?
stand to your feet. Thank you so very much for joining us here today at Church in the Rock. Today's message has been a part of Roger's series, Finding Lasting Happiness in an Unhappy World. We pray that throughout this series that you learn how to cope with the different negative situations that life throws at us. Now, if this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org. There you can look at our latest podcast, tell us how this series touches you, or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.